Tonight, Puerto Rico is hurting. And I cry every day. I cannot see the photos of Maria. I cannot. Five years after Hurricane Maria, the island is still rebuilding from the powerful Category 4 storm that killed thousands. And even now, people are suffering through PTSD. Siempre le pido a Dios que no vuelva otro huracán. No es así tan grande. Frequent blackouts and the need to rebuild. De toda la isla hay techos con todos los azules todavía. So our Channel 9 team flew to Puerto Rico to take these stories straight to those in charge. So do you understand the frustration of the customers who keep experiencing these, these blackouts? To find out if leaders there are better prepared this hurricane season, we're showing you the strength of the storm and of the Puerto Rican people. Next on Hurricane Maria, power and perseverance. Brought to you by the Morgan Law Group. Hola and welcome to Hurricane Maria, power and perseverance. Five years after Hurricane Maria, we're bringing you back to Puerto Rico to show you exactly the state of the island as it is right now. I can tell you, a lot has changed. The territory is under new leadership under Governor Pedro Pierluisi. Now the governor during Maria actually stepped down after protests and uproar after a leaked chat showed he, along with members of his staff, were being insensitive about the loss of life after Hurricane Maria. And now there's a private company in charge of the power grid, but much remains the same. Outages keep hitting more than 3 million people on the island, and that's without a hurricane, leaving many to wonder what would happen if another Category 4 hits. While on the island, we actually went through Santurce, that's in the metro area of San Juan. We spoke to one family there who says they've survived multiple hurricanes, but after Hurricane Maria, it hasn't been the same. In fact, they still dream about it today. The sounds of Maria. My wife and I were holding on. We held it for two hours. Are what torment Angel Santiago Merced. After Maria, I dream that it's still raining a lot, that the sea is really high, that a house is falling. Everyone was affected. If there's one thing that became clear to us during our visit to Puerto Rico, is that those who survived Hurricane Maria live in fear of another Category 4 storm. Maria's winds forced a neighbor's roof onto his walkway. He's lived at this home all his life. He grew up downstairs and built his home as the second story. His mother still lives on the first floor. Can you imagine people in a hurricane screaming? My neighbors, my mom. I didn't know what to do. Thankfully, Angel, his wife, and his mother survived. But he lost everything. TVs, beds, his living room sofa. But before any of that work could begin, he was still in the dark. Puerto Rico was dark for three months. But the military came in at night. They honked their horns, and the neighbors would come down. They gave us bags of food, matches, water. And slowly, Angel says the help arrived for bigger repairs, like replacing his roof. They gave me a $7,500 loan, and I paid $57.56 monthly for seven years. FEMA even paid for an air conditioner. He says he's had a positive experience with FEMA receiving help after Hurricanes Hugo, George, and Maria, but says bureaucracy keeps others from getting that same assistance. Because of something simple, the government doesn't give them the help when they're elderly? Women who are alone, single moms with children who don't have any help because of a piece of paper, they don't qualify? It's bureaucracy. His neighbor's house across the street still has a tarp on the roof. And with months left in this hurricane season, the scars that Maria left behind are ripped right back open. It's like the story of Jesus Christ, before Christ and after Christ. There's before Maria and after Maria. It hasn't been the same. 
So while we're here on the island, we want to check out the power operation. There's two entities involved here. You have Breba that generates the power, and then you have Luma that distributes and transmits that power. Now, Luma is the new private company in this process, and they have gotten a lot of backlash. Uh, residents here say they have not made good on their promises to lessen blackouts, and in fact, a lot of residents say things are worse under their authority. And we're looking for answers as to where we are right now, and if the system, the electrical grid, can handle a category for as it stands right now. Within minutes of arriving in San Juan, it was clear that a lot of Puerto Ricans want Luma out. Que renuncie se vaya de Puerto Rico. Christy Robles, a coffee shop manager, wants Luma and its president and CEO, Wayne Stensby, off the island. I understand that uh, the price of electricity in Puerto Rico is very expensive, and it has gone up dramatically in the last, in fact, in the last 18 months. We sat down with Stensby, who says there's confusion about Luma's role in providing power. PREPA today is still the generation operator, so they're the organization, the government entity that um, operates the power plants. So they produce the bulk of the electricity. Uh, Luma is effectively transports it across the wires and, and presents it to customers. Luma is responsible for transmitting and distributing the power that PREPA generates. Christy understands that, but says the details are still fuzzy. To understand the issue, you have to understand the background. Until June of 2021, PREPA, the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority, generated and managed the island's power. We sat down with PREPA's executive director, Josue Colón. PREPA signed a contract with them uh, that we call the OMA. It's an operating and management uh, contract. They, on our behalf, are in charge of the operation of the system, also of the maintenance, and also they are in charge of the recovery projects. Luma won a 15-year, $1.5 billion contract with PREPA, and in addition, FEMA allocated $9.5 billion toward the island's power restoration. Peor, peor, peor que cuando estábamos con energía eléctrica. But residents say they're just not seeing the results of that multi-billion dollar effort. Cuando no es que se va la luz por hora o por día, es que pasan ese tipo de, de bajones de luz. Yo empecé pagando 77 dólares de luz al mes, ya voy por 200 dólares de luz. A letter to Stensby from the U.S. House of Representatives in October of 2021 states in part, Luma has attempted to increase electricity rates, notwithstanding promises to keep them constant for the first three years of operation. There was uh, an understanding from the public here that rates would not increase in uh, under Luma. So far, there have been five increases. Uh, the latest was 17 percent. What do you say to those that feel like they've been lied to? What Luma said when we um, began operation a little over a year ago is we would not increase rates uh, for the element of the bill, the piece of the bill that Luma is responsible for, and we haven't. We found a way to live within our budgets. There is another portion of the bill that is actually the generation cost, and that's the piece that, that PREPA and the generators um, charge for fuel. And it's true, that has gone up systematically across the last year and a bit. I took that response to Josue Colón during our tour of the Costa del Sur power plant. Yes, at the end, this comes out to the customer because the, the production cost is higher, so the, the rates are going to be higher. Colón says customers are seeing the increase in the price of natural gas combined with the price hikes for fuel after the war in Ukraine started in February. You know, from January to May, we spent uh, close to a billion of dollars on fuels. And from May to June, in, in just a month, we suffered another increase in the prices of 100 uh, million in one month because of the war and because of the, pri you know, the rise on, on the prices uh, of all the fuels. But for us here in Puerto Rico, it's worse because we have uh, more of our unit, or most of our unit uh, are still running on, no. on, on oil.
that's exactly what energy experts say needs to change. And they're responsible for delivering a rate, and the rates have gone up. Tom Sanzillo is the director of financial analysis for the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. They don't get to tell the utility that the kid just grew um, faster than we thought, and so there's new shoes needed um, for the for a child, and so we can't pay the electric bill this month. It doesn't work that way. Sanzillo has worked in the energy industry for decades and says Puerto Rico's dependence on oil is expensive and obsolete. The grid system there, the power plants and what have you, are run on diesel fuel and coal. Um, and around the world, like 1% of the world runs on diesel. Um, nobody runs on diesel anymore. They're stymied on how to move forward on renewable energy, which is what they need to reduce that cost. Oil and coal and gas are very expensive right now, and they are volatile in pricing, and they need to be replaced. You would, that would should be top priority, and it isn't. Stensby says Luma is proud of what they've accomplished in the year since it took over distribution. We connected more rooftop solar in the first year than PREPA had connected in its entire existence. We replaced more than 3,000 poles. We've brought the frequency of outages down. We've been answered an incredible amount of calls. Um, in most cases, we've been able to get our call answer times down to less than a minute. And even some of their worst critics agree. Algo sí hay que decir de Luma. Algo sí hay que decir. Que tú lo llamas y vienen más rápido que lo que venía energía eléctrica. During our time on the island, we did see Luma at work. But Stensby says it's hard to dig themselves out of the hole. He says prepa created. I think we understood the, the system as it was. I do think, though, there has been a historic lack of transparency around the state of the system. There was a lack of transparency prior to Maria and then post Maria. PREPA's $9 billion in bankruptcy, right? $9 billion. The power poles are leaning. The, that didn't happen. You know, Luma arrived and the power pole leaned over. That's been going on for decades. He said that he inherited a broken down system of the power grid from PREPA. What is your response to that? Well, that's, that is true because, uh, you know, the system was uh, damaged from, uh, because of the hurricanes. PREPA is under bankruptcy, um, uh, under Title Three of PROMESA, so we also have a lack of funds to give maintenance and, and repairs to the system. And not just damage from hurricanes, earthquakes too. An earthquake damaged boilers at the Costa del Sur power plant and damage the foundation of two water tanks. They're building new tanks. Not to mention, a fire at a substation across the street from the plant created a massive outage back in April, leaving half a million people without power. We began on a, on a breaker that suffered a damage, and then this is spread out through the whole system and caused the, the major event that happened. Luma is investigating what caused the breaker to fail. Months later, work is still being done to repair it. So we had to ask, can the electrical grid handle another Category 4? The, the system's still fragile. If another uh, hurricane of that category strikes Puerto Rico, we are going to go uh, through maybe the same uh, uh, process uh, as before. The main difference between them and now is that at that time, Puerto Rico and PREPA were not prepared to receive a, a, a hurricane. The grid is not ready for another Category 4, but the response to a Category 4 would be different than Maria. Yes, we will be more quick because we don't need to wait uh, weeks. We have more equipment, more spare parts, more inventory in our warehouses and also in the warehouses at Luma to respond uh, to an emergency. And at the end, PREPA are going to have a better system that are going to provide a better, a better and high quality service to uh, the people that live in the islands of Puerto Rico. It's just tough to say when that end will be. When we are going to finish the whole project, maybe are going to take years, uh, close to eight years uh, from now. Maricao is actually one of the smallest cities in Puerto Rico. In fact, it houses a lot of elderly people, making it more financially difficult to recruit from the storm. Right now, I'm actually told about 70 to 80 homes in this area still need new roofs. And after the break, I'm going to show you one of the homes that's next up for repair. 
five years later, the remnants of Hurricane Maria are pretty visible in some of the interior parts of the island. So this morning, we're actually driving two and a half hours to Maricao. It's in the interior area of the island and it sustained a lot of damage after the storm. And there, we're actually going to meet with a nonprofit organization called Protechos. They're working from the ground up with people to replace blue tarps that remain with new roofs. And we're going to check out Maricao to see how it's fared five years after the storm. There's still 70, 80 homes without repairs. Ovidio Gonzalez is the director of public works in Maricao. Here, practically the entire municipality is below the poverty line. It's people that can't fix the house and pay for water and power. He says last year, there were about 100 homes in Maricao that still had tarps. That's until the nonprofit Protechos came in. Cinco años. Five years later, and we're still rebuilding roofs. Francis Francis, yes, that's his name, is the Protechos representative in Maricao. He walked us through the area. This is one of the houses that we need to work on. Oh. It's, it's next online in, on, in the list. Protechos, or Pro Roofs in English, repairs roofs so they can survive hurricanes. The organization started in response to Hurricanes Irma and Maria. Comenzaron por primera seis techos. It started with six houses, then with more tools and more people, and now we're 30 employees. They work off of donations and partnerships with the local government for funds and materials, but with so few employees, the work takes time. And depending on the extent of the damage, a roof repair can take anywhere from a week to a month. Francis says it can be disheartening. It's a little sad, but at the same time, exciting for us to bring our services all over the island because there are still roofs with blue tarps all over. Especially in areas that are hard to reach. To say Marigao is isolated would be an understatement. It's located in a mountainous region. The roads are narrow and the vegetation lush. We were told after Hurricane Maria, Power lines were tangled in that vegetation along with debris, and the island has thousands of them. Now we have over 30,000 miles of distribution uh, lines around the island. Uh, in the transmission line, we have over 3,500 miles of, of cables, you know. So it's hard to imagine how first responders were even able to reach Maricao after Maria. We drove over two hours to get there from San Juan, and an hour of that drive was spent going up a mountain. And on top of being isolated, Maricao's population is older, making it difficult for them to rebuild. The majority of the population of Maricao is over 55. The income per capita is under 6,000 a year. It's a small municipality with around 4,900 residents. And here, life is calm. The people that live here, it's because we like the peace and the calm that comes with living up here. But it's not easy in terms of job opportunities and the complications with services from the government because of the distance to get into town. And that distance makes it difficult to get the power restored. With winds of just 30, 35 miles an hour, we didn't have power for around three to four days. A Category 1 hurricane is 70, 75 miles an hour at a minimum. So we get scared. We get scared about the time we spend isolated. The power goes out and the aqueduct pumps shut off and then we're without power and drinking water. It's a frightening scenario that they've already experienced after Maria. The hurricane was in September and still in February, March, the majority of the town didn't have electricity. And that affects people not only physically, but mentally. Francis says he sees it when he arrives at a new job. Well, it gets to a point psychologically that people just live to survive. It rains here practically every day after 12 p.m., so every day they have to deal with damaged equipment, a damaged wall, or the tile is damaged and lifting. And worse, impacting people's health. There are people living with that mold all the time and they get sick. This would be a complete repair. We have to take the roof out and start from scratch. We could easily be here a month 
if not more. Protechos not only repairs the roofs, but teaches recipients how to fix them too. Once we leave Maricao, there will be people here with experience and skills to be able to fix their own roof and their neighbor's roof. It's work that's meaningful and long overdue. But for Francis, it's satisfaction. People smile, or they invite us for a coffee or soda, so it gives me the desire to keep working and keep repairing roofs all over the island. That's the goal. FEMA admitted to errors in their response to Hurricane Maria. Coming up, I spoke to a FEMA spokesperson here on the island about what the agency is now doing to make sure those same errors aren't repeated. FEMA received a lot of criticism after Hurricane Maria, particularly from a government accountability report that analyzed the agency's response to the hurricane. Now, FEMA points to several issues here. They were already responding to Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma, not to mention they say they lacked staffing and were dealing with issues with distribution of much needed supplies here on the island. And they admit they didn't have enough Spanish speakers to help the people in need here. So I spoke to a FEMA representative here on the island about what they're doing to make sure none of that ever happens again. Aquí hubo gente que murió deshidratada. ¿Por qué? Cuando se encontraron todas las botellas de agua perdidas, ¿por qué? ¿Por qué nos dejaron morir? No entiendo. It's hard to reckon with images like this. Warehouses filled with water long after Hurricane Maria passed. For local Christy Robles, the response to Hurricane Maria makes her question how FEMA and the government of Puerto Rico would respond to future emergencies. Siempre le pido a Dios que no vuelva otro huracán. No es así tan grande. Pienso que el gobierno pudo haberlo manejado mejor. So I asked FEMA how they're making sure resources aren't wasted in the future. I received this statement in response. Based on lessons learned, the government of Puerto Rico and the Puerto Rico Emergency Management Bureau have identified community organizations that will stand up community hubs around the island in a response operation, in which local leaders will support the commodity distribution. But I also spoke to FEMA's Jose Baquero just hours before leaving the island. I know uh, our schedules have been both crazy, so we're actually heading to the airport soon ourselves, so we appreciate you making the time. Absolutely. He's the Federal Disaster Recovery Coordinator for Response and Recovery Operations in Puerto Rico. He was only uh, available via uh, Zoom. Logistics to get anything here are kind of complicated. Part of what we learned from that is also to have more supplies here in terms of FEMA. FEMA allocated about $28 billion for about 10,000 projects in Puerto Rico. Those billions go to everything from hurricane response, providing things like generators, food and water after a storm, to long-term projects like improving the island's struggling electrical grid. $9.5 billion has been allocated for PREPA under a project called FAST. FAST is, uh, in easy terms, a budget that we gave PREPA. So now they're submitting projects uh, to use that money, specific projects that are evaluated and approved. Those working to improve that grid, like PREPA's executive director, Josue Colón, understand that frustration. But the reality is that those processes are very complicated. Those funds are going to take uh, maybe longer than expected to be received. But that's the process not only here in Puerto Rico, it's the same process in the whole United States. And huge companies like PREPA aren't alone. It's a process felt across the island, even in small municipalities like Maricao, a remote mountainous area located more than two hours from San Juan. Lots of laws and processes. What I've seen is that sometimes there's ignorance within the people who work for FEMA. That type of ambivalence or ignorance of all the laws that apply for the disbursement of money costs time. But officials say five years later things are different. Now, the island is far better prepared to respond after a disaster, both in resources and in personnel. The recovery office, which is the one that I had uh, here in Puerto Rico, has over 800 employees. Uh, 95, 98 percent of those employees are from Puerto Rico. They're Spanish speakers. So we have now uh, about six or seven times the amount of supplies that we had prior to Maria. We only had one warehouse before Maria hit, now we have four. And that resiliency is key. 
PREPA Executive Director Josue Colón says Puerto Rico has to be self-reliant because when the power goes out, there's no one else to help. Our fellow Americans in the mainland doesn't suffer that because uh, the, the whole system is interconnected and they have the opportunity to receive uh, aid from their neighbors mm -hmm. when that happened. Right, other in states. Puerto Rico, yes, mm -hmm. other states or other utilities, mm -hmm. in, even in the same state. Uh, right. yeah. But here in Puerto Rico, we are not like that. Right now, about 30 FEMA projects are approved for PREPA and LUMA, representing about $1.2 billion. It's money that LUMA president and CEO, Wayne Stensby, says they're putting to good use with projects like the Community Streetlight Initiative. We are replacing streetlights and the structures, but those streetlights and all of the associated infrastructure will be designed and built for 160 mile per hour um, hurricane force winds. Um, so that's the beginning of the hurricane hardening, but it will take years to work through that. But for those who have to live through that work, day in, day out, it's a tough pill to swallow. To think that right now in hurricane season, and to say we still haven't repaired or rebuilt from what happened in 2017, it's tough. It's tough to process. For us Floridians, it can be easy to forget just how strong a storm can be, but we wanted to remind you just how powerful Hurricane Maria was here on the island. Certified Chief Meteorologist Tom Terry takes us back to September 2017. Maria was one huge hurricane. And what I think made this storm very unique, of course, we had Irma that hit Florida and parts of the Caribbean just a few weeks prior. But what made Maria unique is the fact it went through what's called explosive intensification. It went from a Category 1 hurricane to a Category 5 hurricane, all the way up to 175 mile per hour winds before going right over Dominica. And then two days later, you can see it's approaching the island of Puerto Rico. So it did not have much time at all to weaken or slow down. Now, the winds did diminish slightly. The storm almost got a little bit out of kilter, and the winds went down to 155, which is the strongest Category 4 rating that we have, but completely went right over the island, as we know, decimating the radar out of Puerto Rico, just shredded it. It was gone. They've since replaced it, but of course did a number on the power grid that they're still dealing with today. And of course, all the heavy flooding that the storm created as it moved over the mountainous terrain. One heck of a big hurricane. So far, we've shown you the mental and physical toll of Hurricane Maria, but there's so much more to unpack, including the economic stress is still on businesses today. Ahead, I met one on one with a local manager about what it took to stay open in the wake of such a powerful storm in an area where shuttered storefronts outnumber open businesses. For businesses here on the island, blackouts can push them to close permanently, but there are two factors at play here, two battles. One is of blackouts. The other is of the economic impact from Hurricane Maria and that constant recovery five years later. I sat down with the manager of Caldera Cafe. She broke down how difficult it was to survive after Hurricane Maria amid a street of stores that are closed down. And I cry every day. I cannot see the photos of Maria. I cannot. For Christy Robles, Hurricane Maria isn't just a memory. The star raining or something and just go to the apps and check it out with something coming or what's gonna happen because we all have PTSD because of that. The coffee shop manager has worked at Caldera Cafe for seven years. It's one of the only businesses that survived in this abandoned part of San Juan. Eh, yo creo que una mezcla de cosas que han ido sucediendo poco a poco. I think it's a mix of things that have happened little by little. First, obviously, the economy has worsened year after year. Maria was devastating. After the storm, there wasn't light or water for months. But Christy and her co-workers didn't let that stop them from jumping in to help. The coffee shop owner actually got a generator installed the day before Maria made landfall. Por aquí putting them in a unique position to help their community. They were back to work just two days after the storm. We had to give food to people who would come and they'd say, 
that they didn't have anything to eat in three days. Que no tenían dinero. That they didn't have money para comprarse un pan con mantequilla. To buy bread with butter. Nosotros cogíamos horas de break cuando estábamos ya. We took breaks when we were at the point of passing out. Days, weeks, months passed, but Esto es algo de todos los días. she feels her government failed her. Nos dejaron morir. They let us die. How do they sleep at night? Christy says she worked for weeks helping strangers without knowing if her own family was alive. Yo no supe de mi familia como por tres semanas ahí. Cuando ese teléfono sonó que yo vi que era mi papá, me eché a llorar antes de contestar el teléfono porque dije, bueno, están bien. But little by little, Christy says things got better. Y empezó a llegar gente a preguntarnos si estábamos bien, si necesitábamos algo. Nos donaron ropa, nos donaron dinero. Y así seguimos para adelante donando nosotros también. But her quality of life isn't the same, especially when it comes to power. The owner of Caldera Cafe actually tells her that the increase to keep the lights on at the restaurant is astounding. De dos mil a tres mil dólares. From 2,000 to 3,000, and it keeps going up. And says when the power is on, it's not optimal. Pero es como un bajón de energía, el voltaje baja. It's like a low voltage, and you notice in the lights when they flash constantly. The light isn't as bright. You notice the brightness comes and goes constantly, and it doesn't stop. It's something tourists notice and complain about. But Christy says they're only getting a taste of what life is really like on the island. How would you describe living in Puerto Rico right now? It's a whole mess because of the taxes, the economy. The power electricity is very horrible. But I don't want to go to the United States because I was born and raised right here. This is not. This is my home, and I want to stay here and grow and see my people fine and grow and everyone with good jobs, you know, with a good quality of life. That's how I'm dreaming about it. Do you think that's possible? I think, yes, I hopeful. I hope that the government change, you know? We can do that. We can do it. And that's not the only business in this economic fight. It's a reality for stores all across the island, and it's a hardship that digs into people's lives. But why is that still the case five years since Maria? We reached out to the UCF Puerto Rico Research Hub for that answer. It's like we have like two different realities, right? Right, like yeah. People that have resources in Puerto Rico are doing great. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have any money, yeah, it's tough. Puerto Rico's financial future has been in question for quite a long time. You know, the economic crisis has been going on for, for decades now. But Dr. Fernando Rivera, director of the Puerto Rico Research Hub at UCF, says that's just the tip of the iceberg. Add that to the destruction of Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Irma, plus the earthquakes, plus COVID, you know, creating those conditions that, you know, are, are testing the will of the people. Testing the will of residents like Christy Robles. Not every person um, can do this, you know, like live humbly. Especially when your basic needs aren't being met. Right, so the perception, I mean, on the street, and it's the reality for a lot of people, why am I paying more and getting less? And you know, with all these battles, something has to give, right? And we're talking, it's just, it's just electricity. You know, just like a basic, basic utility for people. A basic utility that Christy says is difficult to pay without a living wage. La gente no consigue cómo mantener con 8.50 la hora a una familia entera. Así que han decidido irse a Estados Unidos buscando eh, el sueño americano. Uno poder tener una casa propia y no tener que seguir rentando y echar para adelante, tener una mejores oportunidades de empleo, eh, estilo y calidad de vida. Dr. Rivera says it's pushing people off the island. The U.S. Census came out the, the 2020 and it suggested that Puerto Rico had lost almost almost 500,000 people in 10 years. Mm -hmm. A majority of those do end up here. And many who choose to stay say 
They make ends meet by compromising. Es el único lujo que me doy. That's the only luxury I give myself. Air conditioning that I turn on when I go to bed and turn off when I wake up. Imagine that that's a decision that you have to make. I'm going to sweat it out or I'm going to turn on the air conditioning fully knowing that I'm not going to be able to pay the electricity bill. In 2022, that's, that's, that is not a decision that we should be asking people uh, to have. Not in Puerto Rico, not, everybody, not a anywhere in the world. And with the electrical grid in no position to handle another Category 4 storm, Dr. Rivera says all eyes are on Central Florida. Because the likelihood is that people are not going to try to ride it out anymore. In Puerto Rico, a lot of people are going to come to their family members here uh, in Central Florida. Hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans fled to the mainland after Hurricane Maria in 2017. And here in Central Florida, there were challenges in our response. Well, I mean, housing is always an issue here in Central Florida. And, and obviously that causes a lot of pressure when you have more people coming in. Where are we going to put them? Well, what we found that the biggest hurdle was language, which a lot of people, you know, it, it was hard to navigate the waters uh, without having that initial uh, push in, in a language and that they understood. That, that's been a push out here uh, to make sure that the majority of the aid is available in a, in a bilingual type of form. And I think we have moved forward in terms of that. But bigger than that, he says a bridge needs to be built between Puerto Rico and Central Florida, one that can be advantageous for evacuees starting a new life, while also improving the lives of people already living here. Now we have a, a, a shortage of teachers, right? Uh, can we include those bilingual type of teachers out here? Uh, law enforcement, a, every single aspect of life in Central Florida, we're becoming more a bilingual type of place. You know, can we have those, you know, short term or long term type of opportunities for people when they come in, they have a job, they have a place to stay. Do you think there is a way to bring back the middle class in Puerto Rico? It very much feels like it's feast or famine right now. Well, we need to reimagine again. Dr. Rivera says the funds are out there to rebuild Puerto Rico from the community level, and it's part of the hub's mission to find them. Business sectors, other groups that want to invest in something that is going to create meaningful, quick, and in a sense, community-driven work, there are opportunities for that. There's a lot of things going on in Puerto Rico that are positive, uh, that brings about a lot of hope, and the most impactful thing is that it's driven by young people. And I think that's that's what the island needs right now. A category four storm has not hit Puerto Rico under the current administration, but we sat down with the governor and coming up, we'll show you what he says his plan is if another strong storm hits. Politically, so much has changed on the island since Hurricane Maria. The former governor was ousted and we've shown you the mixed emotions towards the current governor. We spoke to Governor Pedro Perrisi about what he's doing now to address their concerns. Con esto de ha sido un desastre. While in Puerto Rico, it didn't take long for us to hear what some people thought of Governor Pedro Pierluisi. Para quien él trabaja? Él trabaja para nosotros. ¿Por qué no nos escucha? What did take long was hearing from the governor. I first reached out to his office in mid-June for an interview. Nearly a month later, I was told he might not be on the island while we were there. Once we returned from Puerto Rico, I made four more requests, only to get a response on September 6th, leaving us just days before the special would air. Gracias, Gobernador. We really appreciate your time today. We'll, uh, we'll go ahead and get started, okay? Bien, gracias. Pierluisi came into power in 2021 after defeating Governor Wanda Vasquez in 2020, but it wasn't his first attempt at governing. Former Governor Rosselló appointed you to a top cabinet position before he resigned. Is that correct? This was way back in the summer of 2019 when he resigned uh, from office. Um, actually, a very turbulent times in Puerto Rico, but again, that's behind us. The Supreme Court of Puerto Rico then declared that Pierluisi's appointment was never confirmed leading to the island's Secretary of Justice, Wanda Vasquez, to assume power. Pierluisi would later beat her in the primary for governor. But do you think that uh, that whole kind of confusion casts a shadow on the transition between Rosselló and eventually you becoming the governor when you won? Well, it's, it's part of our history, uh, unfortunate history. It's like the bankruptcy process that the government went, went through 
we left it behind as well. But for many, it's easy to remain skeptical. Just last month, former Governor Vasquez was arrested on bribery charges linked to the financing of her 2020 campaign. What uh, I can say is it's a government that is pretty stable, no turnover, uh, and we're performing as I expected we would. Pierre Luisi says he's governing over a new Puerto Rico, but with recovery plaguing the island and electricity unstable, experts say people are losing their patience. To people, and now people are saying like, well, look, this is not necessarily working out all the way to a point that politicians can no longer uh, give Luma a break. Up until a certain point, you've been very supportive of the Luma contract. Uh, recently, you did an about face on that. Talk to me about why you chose to speak out against Luma. Yeah, I said that they don't have uh, my support at this point uh, in the sense that I am keeping a close eye on what they're doing. Uh, and the moment that I see any negligent conduct on their part, uh, will be my administration will be reporting it to the Energy Bureau we have in Puerto Rico so that the Energy Bureau can find them. The governor says he found the reason behind a recent power outage unacceptable and demanded structural changes within Luma. They created a task force, but they're on probation with me because I'm, I'm all about results. Luma admitted that they knew that there was a vegetation management issue in one of our principal or critical transmission lines. And, that, and they admitted that they knew about it and didn't fix it. Still, the governor says he's not canceling their contract. This is more complex than that. that we cannot uh, turn the switch off and from one day to the next, um, get somebody else to handle our grid. And our, our energy transformation law requires us to do another procurement process to find somebody else, another private company, to handle transmission and distribution of energy in Puerto Rico because that's required by law. Which begs the question, could the island's former power generator and distributor, PREPA, step up in the event that Luma's contract is canceled. So it's not that easy that we can cancel a contract and, and the next day PREPA can take care of all of this. The short answer is no. Josue Colón, PREPA's executive director, says after PREPA's public-private partnership began with Luma, PREPA lost close to 4,000 employees. It's not that, that easy. And after recent outages, the governor says He's watching every party involved with powering the island. And I am very vigilant and I'm asking all players in government to do oversight over Luma. Um, and the same with the power authority, actually, that handles a generation. Let's do oversight because we need this to uh, work better. We spoke to survivors of Hurricane Maria all throughout our time here on the island, and they have a message for you. The message they want Central Florida to hear coming up. The last hour, we've given you the struggles and the triumphs of people here in Puerto Rico five years after Hurricane Maria. And I asked each and every one of them what they want you to know about what's still happening here on the island. Here's what they had to say. Volver a levantar el pueblo y pues a la gente de, de Florida que venga y no, nos visiten. Este, sé que eh, eh, el pueblo está en recuperación, pero vamos, eh, o sea, es un pueblo resiliente que le gusta trabajar mm -hmm. y vamos, vamos a, a buscar que, que el pueblo vuelva de nuevo. Y... I think the most, um, most powerful thing is, you know, Luma is more than 3,000 Puerto Ricans um, making a difference, rebuilding their island. So uh, if you're in Florida, we're recruiting. Come work for us. We got really good coffee, really good service, and really good food. You know, go and try some of Ongo. Instead of a hamburger, <laughs> we put so much love into that food so you can taste the best of Puerto Rico. We put so much love in that coffee. So you can go to the United States and say, I have the best coffee. I have the best food and the best service. So go to local and spend your money there, because we need it. For the people of Orlando, I want to know that after Maria, the hurricane Maria, they can travel here to Puerto Rico, see the beaches, 
ven lo, los ríos, la, la vegetación, todo lindo, pero no está todo lindo, porque hay todavía calles sin arreglar, puentes sin arreglar, personas pobres. If you want to rewatch any of these stories, you can stream this special on WFTV.com, the WFTV News app, and the WFTV Now app for your smart TV. Thank you so much for being with us this last hour for the special Hurricane Maria Power and Perseverance. Of course, we've showed you so much struggle, but as you can see here, Island Life continues. Thank you for joining us again. Buenas noches. I'm Kirsten Delgado. You've been watching Hurricane Maria Power and Perseverance, brought to you by the Morgan Law Group.